Okay, so uh, the last talk here at 1015 is going to be from Nathaniel, and he's going to talk about traveling ionospheric disturbances, and he's got a, a lot of cool data on whisper, whisper data, whisper net data, so uh, kind of relevant to us. So that's the schedule. I'll get back to this in a minute. We will continue with announcements. The banquet. Unfortunately, if you don't have a ticket, you can't get one because they have to have an, an advanced count. But if you do have one, this is where it's going to be at the Kohler Presidential Banquet Center. And uh, we're going to be uh, reviewing the uh, amazing life of Bob Berninga, WB4APR. So it ought to be a lot of really cool stories. The Washington Room. If you get to the Kohler Center, you'll figure it out. Go left is what I've been told. We're, we're veering left here, and nothing political, just turn left. Or you could go right three times if you wanted to do that. Okay, also coming up in September is the uh, Tapper ARL Digital Communications Conference. We still haven't decided whether it's going to be live or Memorex yet. So uh, it may still be virtual, we are not sure. But if it's live, it'll be in Charlotte, North Carolina, like it was supposed to be in 2020. And then again in 2021, and now it's 2022, and so maybe this will be the year that we have it. We'll have a live one. So a lot more technical stuff than here probably, but uh, if you're interested in SDR and DSP, Internet, APRS, many, many topics of, of uh, technical interest that uh, you'll probably enjoy. And we have a Friday night social, which kind of substitutes for a, a light dinner and get to interact, network with people, and uh, just kind of drop by and listen to the conversations, and you'll hear amazing things. So here is the picture of the Fine Business Hotel, which I think has changed names twice since we signed up. So anyway, it's called the uh, Hilton Charlotte Airport Hotel. We got a really good rate, so uh, look for that on the tapper.org website when we get ready to take uh, sign-ups for it. Becoming uh, next project after Hamvention here will be the DCC, so look for that on the website. A uh, quick update on the kits that we have. A uh, lot of uh, stuff almost there, but not quite there, and some stuff that's uh, been expanded a little bit. Uh, most notably, uh, in the future here, getting closer every minute, the Tangerine SDR, we actually have some real boards back at the Tapper booth, so come by and take a look at those. We've got, uh, we're ready to produce the uh, Magneto Pi hat, which is a three-axis magnetometer for Raspberry Pi, getting ready to produce that in quantity. And we've got the prototypes for most of the Tangerine boards. We're still short the data engine, but uh, that's a, for another forum. But we have a workaround. Come talk to us. We'll show you the boards and give you the rundown of what's going on. Uh, the, probably the best thing you're going to find is whisper transmitters. We now have whisper transmitters for all bands, 160 through 10. And it's a Raspberry Pi hat board, so if you have your Raspberry Pi handy. Okay, I've got to ask this. How many people have Raspberry Pis? How many people have five Raspberry Pis? How many people have 10 Raspberry Pis? Okay, we got, how about 15? 20? How many? How many? 23? Anybody have more than 23? You have more than 23? How, okay, how many? 30? 45. <clears throat> okay, I guess you win, but I'm not sure if you win or what. <laughs> okay, now, uh, to answer this, though, how many of them are still in the box? <laughs> okay, so then you're tied. <laughs> anyway, so take one of your Raspberry Pis out of the box and plug this board onto it and uh, buy it or build it for whichever band you want. So for 20, 30, and 40, we have out of the box ready to go. For the other bands, we have a board without the filter components on it and a kit of filter parts for whatever band you pick. So you'll have to do a little bit of soldering. No SMT, you can see. It's, it's I can hardly do this. It's through hole parts that you have to solder, so it's relatively easy and becomes a Raspberry Pi, I mean a, a Whisper Beacon transmitter. And we've got them here at the show if you want to buy one. I think the show special is $30, and if you're a member, it's $25. So I encourage you to join up, get yourself a discount, buy all five bands. 
We also have some timing products. You've seen these before, so I won't dwell on them too much, but we have these here, and we have a few other uh, limited uh, timing products here. We didn't bring a huge inventory, but we have a little bit of everything. So if you're interested in timing products like these, these uh, five boards here, stop by the booth and we'll enlighten you as to what we have. We're in booths 5009 to 5011, which is in building five in the very corner next to the, on the flea market side right by the double door. So you can see tangerine prototype boards. We have uh, an FT8 SDR demo running, if we can get the antenna to work, which is, we're not sure yet. Uh, we also have a, a free DV wireless microphone demo. It's brand new. So stop by and see. If you're interested in digital voice at all, come by and see that. You'll be interested in that. And we do have a 20 meter whisper demo working. So you can see how that works with the Raspberry Pi. Very simple setup. And you can talk with us and belittle us and give us tell, tell us what you're working on so we kind of know what's happening. That's kind of what we're all here. We'll tell you what we're doing. You tell us what you're doing, and then we'll all be excited. OK, so i got to put in a plug here for, uh, for the uh, editors of QST and QEX who couldn't be here today. Uh, Kai sent me some slides to encourage you to write. These, you guys are the guys doing the experimental stuff in ham radio. And help us all out, write about it. Tell us what you're doing. Tell QEX what you're doing. Tell QST what you're doing. Write about it, because other than being famous by being in QST or QEX, you will uh, help all of us know what you're doing and spread the word. And interestingly enough, does everybody know what QEX is? Everybody? Anybody? Anyway, it's an ARL membership benefit now. So you don't get a paper copy, but you can get it online for free, including with your membership. So I always like QEX better than QST because it had technical stuff in it. So, And then, of course, NCJ and the On the Air, the new On the Air magazine, they're all included as membership benefits too. So, But QEX needs technical articles. They're looking for them, so what better place to go than you guys who are doing technical stuff? This is kind of what they're looking for. QEX, more detailed technical articles, and QST, more general interest. But really, you can let the editors decide. So you can put your article in, and you can say, let them decide, oh, is this too technical for QST, uh, or is it more general interest? Maybe it goes there. They'll be happy to help you do that. Here's the very easy URL, or emails, qex at arl.org or qst at arl.org. And they have great author guides, too. If you're not sure, you're a little nervous about writing, go read one of these author guides. It'll really enlighten you. It's only a couple pages. It's not really hard to deal with. And thank you from ARL. And if you are a little bit nervous about writing for a magazine with a circulation of a couple hundred thousand, or you're not sure of your technical expertise to write for QEX, or you can write for Tapper's PSR, or things that more down to Tapper's uh, interests like uh, RSDRs or uh, APRS, uh, packet radio, DSP, that kind of thing. We have a packet status register, our newsletter, that comes out every quarter. And we're always seeking writers, particularly hams, hams, who would like to write about their projects. And again, I like this one. You don't have to be hiring Percy Maxim to contribute. You don't have to be able to write War and Peace. Sometimes articles are one page. Just take a minute. One page should be pretty easy. It's like a book report you had in high school, right? Not very hard. And they can take any format. Microsoft Word is easy. Uh, whatever editor you like, Open Office, Stana can take anything. So write early and often, just like voting in Chicago. OK, OK, I won't go political on you. So again, back to the uh, schedule. We're gonna, I'm going to wrap up here. And uh, then we're going to get started with John Ackerman, who's going to talk to us about the design of the GPSDO for Tangerine SDR. And then we're going to have John Hayes talk about uh, ARDC grants, why you want one, why you need one, what you should do to get one, who you should, who should you talk to.
And at 10.15, we're going to have, uh, like I said before, Nathaniel talking about traveling ionospheric disturbances. And let's see what we have next here. That's it. So how are we doing for time? Oh, we're a couple minutes ahead. more tips. Okay, I think that's it. So I'll turn it over to uh, John NAUR, the Time Nuts genius and uh, designer of this here board. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Scotty. Uh, when we started designing the Tangerine SDR, one of the things that was important was the ability to do science. Okay. Sorry, is this better? Uh, one of the things that we wanted was the ability to do science grade data collection, which uh, requires being able to time tag, know when the stuff you're receiving is coming in. So for that, the, the radio needed to have both uh, an accurate frequency reference and a time source. So uh, we decided to design a, a GPS-based uh, time and frequency source for that purpose. As you'll see, it's actually going to be useful for more than just that. Uh, the requirement for the tangerine was we needed to have an output at 122.88 megahertz to drive the, the RF module. And the grape receiver, uh, which is one of the ham side projects, will require four uh, different HF, basically local oscillator frequencies. So uh, we, a simple 10 megahertz only would require more external stuff uh, to make it do all that. But we also wanted to have 10 megs available, uh, and uh, uh, that, that will be uh, something you can get if you need to. There's also something that the scientists like called total electron count. And it's a way of measuring uh, what's going on in the ionosphere. And mo uh, modern GPS modules that have dual frequency receivers are able to generate the data that provides that yield. So we wanted the option uh, to provide TEC data uh, for the science users as well. So uh, to meet all that, we set some specifications uh, that we thought would be sufficient. And we wanted the, the long-term frequency accuracy to be better than one part in 10 to the 12th, which is uh, one part in a trillion, I think, if I do the math right. We wanted the stability, how much it wobbles around, to be at uh, one part per billion or better. We wanted to be able to get accurate time within 100 nanoseconds and uh, the jitter on the, the pulse per second signal, how much that wiggles around, less than 10 nanoseconds. And we wanted to have some phase noise specs for the radio. I'm glad to say the design we have meets every one of those requirements and usually exceeds them by several dB, except for the last. We don't quite have the phase noise for, uh, but we don't know yet whether that's due to the temporary hardware setup or something that's may, maybe a limitation in, in the design. So the quickest ever introduction of how a GPS DO works. Basically, a, a crystal oscillator is, is very stable in the short term, but over time and temperature, it drifts and it moves around. GPS has clocks that are locked to the US Naval Observatory's suite of masers and, and cesium uh, references, extremely accurate in the long term, but there's a lot of noise on the signal as you receive it second to second. So the idea of a GPS DO is that you use a phase lock loop or something similar to uh, have the GPS long-term signal steer the crystal to keep it in, in the right place. And the goal is to kind of match the performance as the crystal gets worse, the GPS gets better, and you design it so that you get the best of both worlds. This is called an Allen deviation plot, and uh, you don't need to fully understand it. But it's logarithmic. The bottom is time, how often you take a measurement. If you're looking at your uh, clock every second or every 10 seconds or every 100 seconds, so it starts from 0.1 and goes to uh, 1,000 in this uh, chart. Top to bottom is how much noise there is. Basically, any two measurements that you take, how close together they're, go they're likely to be statistically. And I'm not going to go through the absolute values, but basically the top is pretty crappy, the bottom is pretty good. 
So ideally what you want is the performance to be as low on the plot as you can get it uh, for as long as you can get it. That, that's the goal. So this is what uh, a crystal oscillator uh, can look like. This is actually the one that we're using in the synth DO. So you see it's, it's pretty good. It's nice and flat until you get to about 10 seconds, but then it starts to curve up as temperature and other things uh, start to uh, affect it. Now, this is the GPS. Uh, we only started a second because we have a pulse per second. Can't look at shorter than that. But you can see that it starts out worse than the crystal, but over time it gets better. And if we kept going, it will keep getting much, much better than this chart. So the idea is you want to design something to meet what's called the intercept point of those two curves and get the optimum performance. Well, ta-da, the green line is what the synth GPS DO is doing. So you can see that we are uh, steering the uh, crystal oscillator in a way to get its best performance and uh, then have the GPS follow it uh, out as time gets longer. So that's what a GPS DO does, uh, and that's uh, uh, what we needed to design. The traditional architecture looks like this. You, you basically have the GPS giving a pulse per second signal, and then a crystal oscillator, usually in an oven, usually at 10 megahertz, you divide that down usually to a pulse per second. You compare the two pulse per second signals, and then you steer the frequency of the, of the crystal until they're in phase. And you would keep adjusting the frequency to, to hold them there. And then you take the output. And that's the way virtually all GPS DOs are done. It works extremely well, but it requires several distinct parts. Um, and it still only gives you 10 megahertz. You've got to generate any other frequency separately. This was our first attempt at the GPS DO, and I'm not going to go through this because it's really complicated and we threw it out. Uh, so the question was, was there another approach, another way to do it? Well, it turns out that modern GPS modules, like those that are made by U-Blocks, uh, can generate an output that they call pulse per second, but actually it can go much faster than that. Uh, depending on the model, it can go up to 25 megahertz. Uh, so ah, maybe there's a signal there that we can use. Uh, they also offer uh, dual frequency operation, which gets that TEC value, but also gets much less noise in the short term. Uh, and uh, so you have a single module that can generate an RF signal, uh, usually a pulse per second signal as well, and do it very well. The problem is the phase noise of that signal is absolutely awful. In the short term, it's wandering around. Uh, you never want to put it on a radio. So you need something to clean that up. Also, again, we need to have uh, multiple frequencies available. There are IC chips uh, that are called jitter attenuators made by some companies. The one we're using is uh, called uh, the Silicon Labs. And basically, these things are designed when you've got a board full of, of telecom equipment and you're distributing a clock around uh, the rack and you need to clean it up on each board because of the noise that it picks up. Uh, these chips are basically designed to take an input and generate the local clocks that are used on the board and clean them up. Uh, interestingly, they include a crystal oscillator or a TCXO, a temperature compensated oscillator, uh, as part of the cleanup loop to get rid of the jitter. So, hmm, there's a, there's a loop, there's a TCXO, there's an input. So, uh, we thought maybe this chip could do something. This is a uh, the one that we're using, it's the Silicon Labs uh, 5345. Uh, in the upper right-hand part where the arrow points, that's what they call their, their uh, DSPLL, uh, Digital Something uh, Phase Lock Loop, which is extremely sophisticated and can generate any frequency from about 100 hertz to over a gigahertz. Uh, and it has this, this uh, lock to a crystal, so its output can be very clean. The chip has 10 outputs, and they can be programmed at different frequencies. They're not completely independent, but you can get a lot of different um, options. It also has some ability for holdover. It remembers kind of how the frequency of the input clock was, was changed with time, and it tries to, to track that uh, when, when the uh, input signal is lost. So it does a lot of neat stuff. And as a result, this is the clock module. Uh, part two, it only has three mo components, really. Uh, a GPS, uh, this Silicon Labs chip, and a 50 megahertz TCXO. 
we get 10 outputs. Uh, one of them is at 122.88, but the others can be whatever you want. And it can also take multiple inputs. So if you've already got a good frequency reference and you just need to change the output, you can use it just as a synthesizer, uh, feed a signal into one of these auxiliary inputs, and uh, get an output that's derived from that. So if you already have a lab-grade uh, GPSDO, you can use that uh, to get uh, even better performance. This is it. Um, we have uh, some at the booth. I actually saw this in person for the first time yesterday when Scotty finally remembered to get out of, out of his pocket. Uh, this, this thing is less than 40 millimeters square. It's a six layer board. The uh, temperature control crystal oscillator is five by 3.2 millimeters. It's tiny. Uh, but this is the complete uh, uh, synthesizer GPSDO. Um, we use an M.2 connector, which is the same that solid state drives use. They're extremely inexpensive and they're very high speed. Uh, that was Scotty's idea. It was just a, a brilliant way to help us connect the boards together. It's initially designed to plug into the Tangerine data engine. However, because of all the cool things that it can do, we'll have a time nuts version uh, carrier board that will bring all 10 of those outputs out and provide some other nifty tools. So as a time nut, you'll be able to do lots of cool things with this. As I already mentioned, you've got 10 outputs. Uh, we get a PPS that comes from the GPS module. Um, and you don't need to have a GPS installed if you want to just use it as a synthesizer. You'll notice on the board, the right hand is the top, and that has a U-Blocks module mounted on it. That's the ZF9T, which is the, uh, about $200 dual frequency one. The other side of the board has a hole where we can mount a smaller uh, U-Blocks module that's lower cost. So we actually will we'll have three different GPS modules available and sort of a good, better, best performance uh, option. And as new modules come out, U-Blocks tends to stick with the same form factors. So we'll be able to use different, uh, better GPSs as they become available. So the performance levels that we'll have is, is one, you can buy it with no GPS at all, in which case it's just a synthesizer. So if you've already got signals running around, you just need to make some different ones. You can do that. Uh, the bronze version, uh, I was in marketing once, uh, uses a, a very inexpensive GPS module uh, from U-Blocks. They're about $15 uh, in quantity 250, so pretty cheap. Um, they work surprisingly well. They don't work as well as the more expensive ones, and they don't provide a separate pulse per second when they're generating the RF. So if you use that one, you, you don't really want to use it for timing applications, but just for RF, it works very well. The next step uses a slightly fancier chip that's about $80. Um, that works better, has the PPS. And then finally, uh, the gold version is the dual frequency receiver. And, and that module uh, is currently about $160. And so you can see that the GPS module is a major part of the cost um, in the system. The Silicon Labs chip is less than $20 in quantity. Uh, the TCXO is about 30. So this is really the determining factor in the cost. Uh, I have not had a chance to test the actual hardware yet because I have never saw it until today. This was the breadboard that I used for some fairly uh, serious test work. Uh, Silicon Labs has an evaluation board, which is the big blue one in the middle. The thing wrapped in pink is the TCXO, and the pink is uh, some foam to help the temperature. Uh, the little green boards are output couplers, and then there's a GPS module in the lower right. All of that stuff together is what's on our 40 millimeter uh, by 40 millimeter board. So this is the preliminary data from that, that board. And this is just how much the signal uh, is changing in time over a period of uh, 18 hours. So it's kind of a strip chart. Uh, it's showing phase rather than frequency, but that doesn't really matter. The important thing is you can see the, the noise level. Uh, the green is the cheapest GPS module. So it's got more. Uh, uh, short-term noise, it also wanders around a little bit more. Uh, the violet is the mid-range module, uh, which is quieter and, and more stable. The blue is the expensive dual-frequency module, and again, it's quieter yet. In the upper right here, um, you can get the frequency offset of the signal uh, from this. And uh, the cheap version 
in the mid-range version, over 18 hours are about one part in 10 to the 13 of accuracy, which is about a one tenth of a part per trillion. The uh, more expensive one is about uh, 0.02 parts per trillion, at 10 to the minus 14th. So uh, you get very, very good accuracy from this thing if you average over time. Going back to that Allen deviation chart I showed, this is a way to easily see the difference in how the three GPS modules work. Uh, the blue is the expensive one, the green is the less expensive one, the violet is the mid-range. At very short term, they're just about the same because they all are using the same uh, TCXO that provides the short term stability. But as time goes on, you can see that the expensive one gets better faster um, and if this was a longer plot, this is only eight, 18 hours, uh, over several days you would see that the green one, in addition to being higher, would sort of flatten out. The others would tend to keep going down uh, further. Uh, so there, there's definitely a performance difference between the three modules, but even the cheap module works pretty darn well. It's, it's never worse than uh, a tenth of a part per billion of stability, uh, which is not bad at all. Uh, phase noise uh, is important for RF. I'm not going to spend much time on this, but this is the curve um, at 122 megahertz. Phase noise scales with frequency. So uh, the noise floor here is about minus 142 uh, dB uh, uh, noise one hertz away from the carrier. I'm sorry, uh, one megahertz away from the carrier. Uh, if we were looking at this at 10 megahertz, it would be about 21 dB better. So uh, the performance isn't bad, but I was just hoping to get a little bit more than that. So the, the current status has been lots of testing on the uh, evaluation board lash up that, that I showed, and I'm still going to do some more long-term uh, testing. The problem is with only one of those units, and these tests typically wanting to run, ideally I'd like to do five or 10 days. Well, that's for each of the three GPSs, so that's a month of data collection uh, so it takes a while, uh, so I'm going to be continuing doing that. Uh, we have, I think, Scotty, it's 25 uh, prototype boards that have been built, um, and most of them have the expensive GPS, but we're going to put each of the less expensive modules um, on, uh, on one. And we need to have a board for the, the, the module to plug into, because among other things, the synthesizer chip uh, it needs to be uh, have its firmware loaded at boot time. If you make it volu if you you can do a write once, but if you do, you're never ever going to be able to change anything, which which isn't good for our application. Uh, so we need some way to upload uh, uh, firmware. Uh, Scotty is working. I think he'll talk about this uh, later. The data engine that we want, we don't have because of parts availability. Scotty's designed and intermediate interface board uh, that will let us test the radio, but it will also give me the connections that I need to be able to test out uh, the uh, Synthio modules. And with that, we'll be able to do kind of what uh, final testing looks like. Um, and then independently, we're working on the Time Nuts board uh, that will again have probably 15 SMA connectors on it by the time we're finished, uh, but allow you to get access to all the, the cool IOs. And that is it, Scotty. Yes. Oh, phase noise? Sure. This one? The phase noise? Oh, okay, I'm sorry. So this, is, this is what we were hoping to accomplish at, at the design phase, and we've, we've uh, pretty much beat all of these at this point, except for the, the phase noise floor. And I'm sorry, but it's very noisy for Right now, uh, 
would be minus 145 instead of minus 150. And that's at 122 megahertz. Okay. If I'm next to the microphone, I can't hear him. I'm, so, I'm sorry. Uh, it's the, the, the noise floor that we are getting with this test lash up, and I don't know if the test, la test lash up is optimum, is about minus 145 dBc at a 1 megahertz offset. Our goal was minus 150. So we're not quite there, but we're not uh, too awfully far off. Yes? How much of these measurements are noise um, for this purpose, not much. Uh, the frequency reference that we're using is a passive maser, and uh, uh, John Miles type uh, phase noise and analysis, plus my ticks for the pulse per second measurements. So yeah, so the, the, what we're seeing here is, is just device performance, not test system performance. Yes. Uh, good, good question, Phil. Uh, the, the traditional GPS is on what's called L2, uh, 1575 megahertz. I'm sorry, you're right, L1. Uh, L2 is the second frequency that most units use, and that's what we're using currently, uh, and that's at 1275. U-Blocks has recently come out with a version of the chips that is L1, L5, instead of L1, L2. I have not played with one of those yet. Don't know what its relative performance might be. My understanding is that the L5 signal is better for uh, urban canyon signal to noise uh, and interference. I, I don't know if it's supposed to be quite as good as the L2 um, phase. So we'll, we'll have to play with that when it's available. But uh, right now, we're, we're looking at L1, L2. Yeah, um, you can get uh, antennas from DigiKey. U-Blocks has one, you know, Hockey Puck. It's about 90 bucks. And I have seen some Chinese ones that are cheaper. So the, yeah, the, the antennas used to be a problem for dual frequency. You kind of had to find a surplus surveying antenna. And they were you know, $10,000 new. But now you, you can get the mag mounts for you know, well under $100. Uh, the, there, there is a, a, a bias on the uh, antenna jack uh, from the module, so it will run a powered antenna without any external power supply required. Okay, well, thank you very much, everyone. All right, thank you, John. Let's see, we're still a couple minutes early. That's good. So up next, we have uh, John Hayes from ARDC. It's K7, K7. I always get the prefix wrong. K7VE. He's going to talk to us about grants. Let's see if I can get this going here. So Scotty just uh, proved that you can train an old ham. Uh, I now know where the buttons are. Um, welcome. Uh, always fun to be at a Tapper event, and uh, we're going to share with you a few things about ARDC. Um, anyone here in the room familiar with ARDC? About half. Uh, we uh, have our president in the back, I believe. Uh, Steve up here is on our grants committee, so uh, we have some representation. So, if you're not familiar, um, back in the early 80s, uh, 
we got 16 million IP addresses for use for ham radio. And in the intervening years, we used them, but we didn't use all of them. And so back in 2019, we took uh, a fourth of those addresses and sold them on the open market. That generated an endowment fund of uh, just over $100 million. She, that's a pretty good endowment. And from that endowment, we make um, uh, grants. And last year, we did $9 million, but that's because we fell short the year before. Uh, our run rate is about $6 million, which you can see here, which is what we'll uh, distribute this year. And Tapper specifically uh, has so far received $139,500 uh, in grants to help with the R&D and the building up of, of Tangerine, correct? And we hope to continue to work with Tapper because they handle the funds responsibly, they develop good stuff, and uh, they do some really good work. So thank you for that. So we have some requirements if you want to get a grant from us. Uh, so if you're looking to get a grant, these are uh, cash grants. Uh, you don't have to repay them. Uh, they're money to do projects that are of interest. First of all, uh, in the U.S., we give to IRS 501c3 uh, type institutions and groups, uh, public charities. Uh, we can also do it internationally, and we'd actually like to increase our international presence in the coming years. Um, we can give to nonprofit educational institutions, um, government projects that align with our mission, uh, and our mission is uh, building up amateur radio, of course, education, and um, R&D. Uh, groups and individuals that are not in those categories, if they align with an organization that fits one of those categories, can receive a grant, but the grant is made to an organization that fits those categories, and then they act as a fiscal sponsor. So if you've got a really great idea you want to work on, but you don't have a 501c, you can go to an organization like TAP or like a local club or someone like that that falls into those categories, a university, and have them sponsor your project. And we write the grant to them and then they administer the funds out to you. So uh, you don't have to go create a 501c3 if you can find one that can help you out. This is known as fiscal sponsorship. When you make the application, we have a place for you to put down who is your fiscal sponsor. So, as I said, there are three categories. Uh, the first category is support and growth of amateur radio. We're getting a lot of applications in this area. Um, they're core to our mission. I mean, they're, you know, the, the money came from that, so we'd like to put some of it back. Um, we have gotten a lot of uh, funding requests to uh, run training sessions, funding requests to uh, bring together uh, people for licensing. Uh, we've done some repeater infrastructure, uh, and on occasion we'll do uh, emergency communications projects. We're particularly interested in projects that, which include underrepresented individuals and groups. Um, as I look across the room, the majority of us look like me old white guy, uh, so we would like to see uh, more outreach to youth. We've got some great projects working in that area, uh, to women uh, and to minorities. Um, so if you have a project that does that, please send your proposal to us. Oops, sorry. Um, the second category is uh, education. Uh, we don't directly fund uh, scholarships, but we find partner organizations to run the scholarship program, and then we provide funds for that. So like last year, ARRL's uh, 
scholarship fund, I think, was about half funded by us, which allowed them to award a lot more scholarships than they had in the past. We've worked with organizations like FAR, um, OMIC, uh, and others. Uh, the Society of Women Engineers uh, received a grant uh, for a bunch of uh, scholarships that they're sponsoring, uh, and more coming along in that. Another one that uh, uh, falls into this area is, uh, it kind of stretches across education and uh, of research. Uh, we did a, a fairly sizable grant to Olin College last year, which is a technical college in the Boston area. It's an undergrad school, but it operates more like a grad school. The students do research, publish papers, do conferences, that kind of thing. And uh, they had four major projects. You can read about it on our, our website. Um, research and development, which obviously Taffer falls into. Um, the, uh, uh, we want to advance the start, the, the art of amateur radio and digital communication science. Um, when we look at digital uh, communication science, uh, we want some innovative things. Uh, you know, there's plenty of money out there if you're building, doing a 5G uh, research project that's going to be commercialized. But if you come up with something that's more unique, uh, or particularly if it crosses over into the amateur radio field, uh, we're really interested. We funded a group called Rhizomatica uh, last year, or earlier this year, the years run together. Uh, that are doing a bunch of work on digital communications, both on HF and higher frequencies, and, and creating community networks uh, and reach out into uh, the rest of the world. So, how do you apply for a grant? You can apply for a grant at any time. Today, six months from now, uh, we collect grants, and then four times a year, our advisory committee gets together, reviews those grants, ranks them. Uh, we have a, a pretty broad and experienced uh, grants committee, 10 people on it. Um, and that gives us the ability to really go through these. We have differing opinions sometimes, uh, but in the end, we get down to the best grants and those are forwarded to our board uh, who meets and uh, does the final approval of what will be funded. Um, we've already passed two deadlines for this year. The next two for these review periods uh, are July 15th and October 1st. So anything that comes in below before July 15th will be in the July 15th review cycle. Anything that comes in before October 1st and after July 15th uh, will be reviewed in the October 1st. If you get your application in after October 1st, <clears throat> excuse me, they'll roll over to next year. So uh, if you want funding this year, you need to go for those. And you can apply uh, online. Uh, there's the URL. Uh, it's pretty simple. Amper or apply. Um, there's some questions there. Be sure you address them. You can either write up your proposal and upload it or simply answer the questions. I will say the more um, complex and more expensive your proposal is, the more you should put in there, the more complete it should be, because as people are reviewing it, uh, you know, we're trying to be good stewards of the money, and of course, if we're spending a whole bunch of money on a single project, then there's a bunch of others that we can't do. Okay, so here's some key points when you're um, applying. Be sure you review all of the information on the website. Um, the, it's organized pretty well. It has a series of steps that you should go through and everything. Um, we really like to see projects that are shovel ready. In other words, you've lined up everything, you've worked it out. Uh, again, Tapper sends us a really nice perspective of what they need to do. Um, so do similarly yourself. We had one project that was a fairly large one early in our cycle um, and we funded it and then they had to 
come back to us and re reset the expectations because they hadn't done all of the lineup. They needed some sites and so on, and they hadn't prearranged that. We'd like to avoid that. We want something that's already send us the money. We can get it done. Uh, we shoot for around a one year completion time. We can go longer if need be, the summer shorter, uh, so on. Uh, when you're working out your budget, include everything. Um, we have a habit as hams of trying to do things with bailing wire and duct tape, and uh, we forget that it costs money to get the widget from here to there. So we want the shipping costs, we want the taxes, any fees. Uh, if you need professional services like a tower climber, uh, include all of those. If you're working with an educational institution or a sponsoring, a uh, fiscal sponsor, they have some administrative costs. Uh, they're referred to as indirect costs in the industry. Uh, include those as well. We will allow up to 20% on top of the value of the proposal uh, of the grant uh, for those indirect costs. Uh, again, one of the reasons that we really like uh, working with Tapper is they do those efforts with volunteers, so that leaves us a little extra money there, but we are totally willing to uh, include indirect costs. Um, we want you to select modern quality equipment, but don't gold plate it. You know, I, I got one proposal. Uh, the guy was starting a club and he wanted two $12,000 HF transceivers for a club that he figured if he bought this stuff, then they would come. He had no members kind of thing. Um, so uh, be realistic in that. Um, so don't gold plate it and don't under specify. Uh, if, let's say you were buying a repeater and you could get a $2,000 repeater, but for 3,000 you could get one that would last 20 years instead of five, uh, we'd rather see that little bit of uplift in price uh, in order to have long-term viability. Uh, and have a project plan that includes the typical who, when, where, and why you want to do this and, uh, and map that out for us. Again, the more complex, the more expensive the project, the more detailed those sections need to be, but uh, we do need to at least have uh, those things. Um, the first year and a half, two years that we were doing grants, we weren't well known. I was out knocking on doors and saying, can I give you money? Um, we don't have to do that so much anymore. We do for certain types. Uh, for what we call aspirational goals, uh, but we have more applications than we can fund in a given year. Um, again, about six million a year, we give approximately a quarter of that at each one of those review periods. Um, so you need to make your proposal stand out. You know, we'll get a proposal, we wanna buy a repeater, thank you this much money. Well, why? What makes yours special? Why do we need to, to fund that? So include things like your previous accomplishments, show how you were doing outreach and building a community around your project. Uh, and that doesn't mean just hams, but are you reaching out to the broader community and bringing them into your project? Um, we have a requirement that anything that's funded by us needs to be open source. Um, or and open access so if you're building a network of closed repeaters for you and your four buddies that's not going to get funded if you're building hardware that all the documentation is published so someone else can benefit from it that's more interesting to us um, if you have an opportunity to do some inclusiveness and equity uh, for your group tell us about that um, particularly include how you will engage youth. Again, most of us look like me. If this hobby is going to survive a few more decades, we need some young people in it. And we've got some really great projects out there going on that right now. Um, we don't need a book. 
you don't need to write a you know an encyclopedia of, of your project, but we need enough that the uh, committee can see. Yeah, this is this is a well planned planned project. Um, and if you have other fundraising, tell us about it. Uh, you know that way we uh, that's part of the community support thing. Also, if you're a five hundred one c three, you have to get a certain percentage of your annual um, funds from a broader community. So we can't come in and fund 100% of your 501c3 or you'll lose your IRS uh, designation. Consult your tax attorney, I'm not the tax attorney. And basically, how will your project make the world a better place? Mm -hmm. It's pretty simple. So come talk to us. Uh, there are several ways. We have a booth in Building 1. Um, our entire staff is here to meet with you, so if you want to come by and talk about an idea and see if it makes sense for the uh, funding that we do. Um, we also have a couple of board members there uh, dropping in periodically, so you'll have a good chance to present yourself. Any questions that you have, email giving at ardc.net and uh, that box is monitored by a couple of us, the grants manager and myself, and we'll try to get back to you uh, as expeditiously as possible uh, with answers to your questions. And with that, I'll open the floor to questions. So the question was, are we getting more uh, inquiries from like universities or high schools or so on? Uh, right now, our biggest uh, number of applications are actually coming from amateur radio clubs and groups. But in the education sector, uh, we have everything from middle school through graduate programs applying to us. Does that answer it? All right, I've not seen any other hands. Thank you very much. Come by the booth and visit us. Thank you, John. Yes, and just to point out, uh, a lot of the progress on Tangerine SDR is due to grants from ARDC, so it's really helping. Especially when we got clogged up with supply chain issues, they really helped us get around that. And uh, come by the booth, I'll show you what we did with the money. And, uh, okay. Next up is Nathaniel Fussell, N2NAF, and he's going to talk to us about Traveling ionospheric disturbances. So for those of you who aren't disturbed enough yet, here he comes. Hi everyone, how are you? Good, I'm Nathaniel, uh, W2NAF. Um, I'm an assistant professor at the University of Scranton and I'm the leader and main founder of the Ham Radio Sciences and Investigation. And uh, this morning I'm going to talk to you about a study that I've actually been working on for a couple of years, but uh, we finally just got it published uh, in geophysical research letters about two months ago. Um, and I think it's a really neat study because it really shows how, um, yet another way how space weather affects both the ionosphere and amateur radio communications, HF communications. So the title of this talk is Amateur Radio Communications as a Novel Sensor of Large-Scale Traveling Ionospheric Disturbances. And you know, I, I have a lot of people who are working with me, uh, some of whom are students, some of whom are other professors, some of whom are volunteers in the community. So I'd, I'd really like to thank all of those people, all of my co-authors. 
Uh, so as a, a reminder, I think most people here know this, but you never know who's in your audience. Uh, all of our HF communications, so long distance ones, uh, they can travel around the world uh, thanks to the ionosphere. And this is the electrically charged layer of the Earth's upper atmosphere that's generated primarily by solar ultraviolet uh, and X-ray energy hitting the Earth's neutral atmosphere and ionizing particles up there. So you'll knock off electrons from neutral particles and then you get this plasma of, of free-floating electrons and free-floating positive ions. And so because of atmospheric chemistry and gravity and things like that, you can get this, uh, these layers of the ionosphere that during the day you have the most structure uh, you have closest to Earth the D layer, the E layer, the F1 and the F2 layer going from 80 kilometers altitude up to about 300 kilometers altitude. And then at night, the ionosphere doesn't disappear completely. It just uh, reduces as the electrons find their positive ions and turn back into neutral particles. Uh, so at night, you get uh, more of just an E layer and an F layer. Uh, so. Uh, we're used to thinking about our radio signals going up and hitting uh, one of these layers like the F1 or the F2 layer and then refracting back down. Uh, but you can also have influences uh, where you get these uh, periodic or quasi-periodic changes, um, a wave that goes through the ionosphere. And so that's what you see over here. This is a, a ray trace uh, simulation of uh, the ionosphere. So up here you have the ionosphere. This is from a model called the International Reference Ionosphere. And you have a wave uh, in the electron density that's going from the high latitudes down towards the equator. And this is a very typical sort of pattern for this kind of wave. Uh, here in this particular uh, diagram, we're seeing waves that have a wavelength of about a um, few hundred kilometers, maybe. These are medium scale traveling ionospheric disturbances. Now down here, we're looking at a vertical cut of the ionosphere that's going from this point over to this point. And those rays are radio rays that are on 14 megahertz. So we're using the uh, FARLAP, uh, actually this is not FARLAP, but we're using a numerical ray tracing program to predict where those rays are going to go. Now you can imagine you have one ham radio transmitter here and you have another ham radio transmitter out there. And what does this uh, station out here here from this transmitter if you have this wave moving overhead. Well, you can see these rays get focused and defocused by the wave, by these um, waves that are going overhead, these disturbances, and you'll see that it clumps and declumps these rays down on the ground. And so if you're operating HF and you have a traveling atmospheric disturbance going overhead, what this means is that you'll periodically get a stronger signal from this transmitter and then a weaker signal from this transmitter and that will repeat over and over and over again. So that's a traveling atmospheric disturbance. You might hear it as like QSB or fading um, with you know periods of 15 minutes to even a few hours. So I wanted to know, I've, I did my uh, PhD using the SuperDARN network um, and I studied these traveling atmospheric disturbances a lot. I wanted to know, can we actually see this in the ham radio data too? So I went to uh, the different global ham radio observation networks, the Reverse Beacon Network, WhisperNet, and PSK Reporter, and I was able to download a bunch of their data and I plotted it. And so that's what you see over here. This is data from over the United States from all three RBN, WhisperNet, and PSK Reporter networks. This is 12 hours of those observations uh, plotted uh, from 12 universal or Zulu time to 24 uh, UT and going from 500 to 200, 2,500 kilometers distance between the transmitters and the receivers. And what you can see, so this is really showing you on 14 megahertz what the typical length distance of a QSO is for this period of time. And you can see this is during the day, daylight hours. This is, you don't just have a straight line here on the bottom. You can see distance, it actually oscillates with time. In fact, I was able to draw a sinusoid uh, on the plot with a two and a half hour um, period to it, and it fit the data very well. So then I said, well, that's my traveling ionospheric disturbance. So now, of course, I needed to go actually confirm it with other data sets and also try to 
just get some idea of where it might actually be coming from. So the first data set I uh, tried to uh, compare it to was the super darn data because I was so used to that from graduate school. And it, the super darn radars actually work very similarly to how our amateur radio HF QSOs work. So this is, um, I used radar from, I used data from the radar in Blackstone, Virginia, which you can see a Google Earth uh, view here. This is what we call coherent scatter radar, operates between 8 to 20 megahertz. There's a 16 antenna linear phased array, which you can see here is 750 feet long in the photo. Every transmitter um, puts out between two to 800 uh, watts. You can phase it all together, and this thing can measure uh, Doppler shifts, uh, spectral width, and signal to noise ratio of the signals that come back. And here is a, another picture of the antennas, a side view. So there's the radar hut, and there are, uh, these are twin terminated folded dipole antennas, uh, 16 of them. And so what you can do is you can, here's a field of view of the whole radar, you can electronically steer what azimuth it's looking at. So I looked at uh, straight down the middle of the radar field of view, beam 13, which is highlighted in red here, and you can see that matches up very well with where we have the most coverage from the RBN WhisperNet and PSK reporter data. And lo and behold, if I plot that um, data from the Blackstone radar, you get the exact same sort of skip distance there. So it's a really nice confirmation that we're seeing the same sort of thing using independent techniques. Uh, so another uh, technique I wanted to look at is something called total electron content, which John Ackerman, NAUR, talked about in his uh, talk at the beginning of the session. So this is a measure of the total number of electrons between um, a GPS or global navigation satellite and uh, on the in space and the receiver on the ground. And if you look at the phase delay between the L1 and the L2 signals, you can actually back out the total number of electrons between the satellite uh, in, the, in space and the receiver on the ground. And you can, there's a network of these GPS receivers located throughout the entire United States and around the world. And there are uh, people like the MIT Haystack Observatory and JPL will aggregate all of this data, run the calculations to count, compute the TEC, and then they'll even detrend the background for you. So now you can see you got a product called what we call differential total electron content. So here, zero is your green, that's kind of like the average state, and then you get plus and minus. Well, if you look at uh, a period of time that comes from the same November 3rd, 2017 date I was just showing you, you can actually see the wave structures here um, and here. So there's the wave peaks and there's a trough right in the middle. And I'm actually able to compute um, a wavelength of, of this wave. And if I look at a time series of this data, so here I just took the um, uh, mean or the average of all of the TEC in this box over here. I plotted it uh, as a function of time. I'll show you in a minute that this anti-correlates with uh, the ham radio and super darn data very well. I also took a FFT fast Fourier transform of the of this signal, and I got a peak right at two and a half hour, two and a half hours, which again matches the sinusoid I plotted earlier. So here's a really nice movie of the whole thing. What you can see is that as the skip distance in the amateur radio data moves closer in, the map's going to turn more red, and that's because as you get more electron density in the ionosphere, higher TEC, uh, you end up getting more refraction, which makes your signal come in closer. And then here, where you have it go out, um, when it goes out in range, you see more blue colors because you get less refraction. So I'll just let the movie play here for a minute. So you should be able to see waves propagating from northeast to southwest and anti-correlating with the amateur radio data. So uh, one of the things we need to do is we need to be able to take the actual amateur radio data and try to estimate can we look at just the amateur radio data and see what direction um, the waves are going? And you know, sure enough, 
what we can do is we can take that same ham radio data before, but we can split it up into latitudinal slices and just look at the waveform as we go from higher latitudes towards lower latitudes. And so if you look at the maximum uh, where you have the skip distance maximum here, you can see a phase progression indicative of a southward traveling wave. It's, um, when you get down to the bottom here, it does move back a little bit, but it's a very complicated wave field. So um, I think we've captured a coherent wave up here, and then here we might be seeing some other wave structure down here. But more or less, for these uh, four slices, you get a really nice phase progression. If you look at longitudinal slices, you really don't see much phase progression. So it's really indicating that's moving primarily from the north to the south. So uh, from all of this, uh, we've been able to estimate the large scale traveling atmospheric disturbances. So large scale meaning that it has periods of longer than 60 minutes and phase velocities greater than 1,000 uh, kilometers per hour. Um, and horizontal wavelengths greater than, you know, a few hundred kilometers. And so we were able to compute these parameters. Uh, but we wanted to know also where do these things come from. So if you look in the literature, you can find out that large-scale traveling atmospheric disturbances are primarily generated by disturbances that actually start in the auroral zone. So you'll have an auroral event which can send um, particles from space precipitating into the auroral zone. You can get current surges in the auroral ionosphere. You can get joule heating. All of this can launch these things called atmospheric gravity waves, which then couple with traveling ionospheric disturbances and propagate down toward the mid-latitude region. So to look at that, one of the pieces of data we've looked at um, were measurements from the poker flat incoherent scatter radar. This is a different type of radar than the super darn radars. Uh, incoherent scatter radars, they can measure electron densities, temperatures, uh, ion temperatures and composition, uh, plasma velocity, how fast the ionosphere is moving. And um, it, one of the benefits of an ISR compared to an ionosond is uh, ISRs can measure both the bottom side and the top side of the ionosphere. They can measure above the F2 region peak, which ionosonds cannot. Um, so this is a picture of the poker fly and coherent scatter radar. It's the same type of radar as Arecibo, which unfortunately collapsed, uh, but hopefully we'll get something back. Uh, the Millstone Hill radar, uh, this one operates between uh, 430 to 450 megahertz. I think this particular one usually operates between 449 and 450. It's got a two megawatt peak power. So these things are big radars. Um, and you can see this, there's no moving parts here. This is also an electronically phased array. So there's all sorts of, there's all little um, individual antenna module units that can be individually uh, phase controlled so you can uh, steer the beam in almost any direction you want, all electronically. It's really quite amazing. So here's measurements from it. Um, this is the Pfizer electron density. Uh, for context, this is the event I was showing you before. So here's our ham radio data. You can see the oscillation down here. So two to three hours before we start seeing the oscillation, we see an enhancement in the Pfizer electron density and also an enhancement in the joule heating. And the idea is that joule heating is what launches the atmospheric gravity waves. Um, so this is a clear indication of auroral activity a few hours before we start seeing the traveling atmospheric disturbances. Um, also up here I have something plotted called the SuperMag Electrojet Index. These are measurements uh, from ground magnetometers in the auroral zone, and so those are showing enhancements in um, auroral electrojet currents also happening at the same time. Uh, so if you were to say that the TIDs that we observed in amateur radio came from down here in the, in the United States, and you were to say, okay, uh, we'll take the phase velocity we computed and the um, azimuth that we said it was coming from, and we project back uh, over a range of periods to you know, do plus and minus estimates, that suggests that the source region is from here. Over here is Pfizer, and this red box around here, that's the region that um, the, uh, that the auroral electrojet surges occurred using that ground magnetometer data. So you can see that um, the disturbances project right back into the region where we would expect, where, we'd, where we're actually seeing these auroral disturbances. So this is highly suggestive of 
this auroral disturbance causing these large-scale traveling atmospheric disturbances that are affecting our amateur radio communications. So, um, our conclusions, we saw a large-scale traveling atmospheric disturbance. Um, we were able to estimate uh, that it had a period of about two and a half hours, wavelength of about 1,680 kilometers, phase velocity between 1,100 to 1,200 kilometers per hour, and it was propagating uh, southeast with an azimuth of about 163 degrees. The auroral zone activity uh, occurred about three hours prior to the observations, and that's a likely candidate for the LSTIDs observed on that day. And so these results, they lay the foundation for future use of amateur radio communications observations as a method for the study of LSTIDs. And conversely, as amateur radio operators, if you're seeing this, these behaviors, um, this long-term QSB in your communications over a contest period or something like that, now you have an idea why it might be happening. So these results were published in geophysical research letters just a couple months ago, and you actually just got an editor's highlight from AGU uh, about two days ago. So you can uh, read more about that. I have some copies over there if you like. And if you'd like to get more involved in HAMSI, you can go to hamsci.org, click the Join HAMSI button, and you can visit us in uh, booth 5008. And as you can see, I've got three students here, two from the University of Scranton, one from New Jersey Institute of Technology. So we're working really hard to involve youth uh, in amateur radio and promote diversity and, and really make this something. You know, we really work hard to get our uh, volunteers who have a lot of experience from the amateur radio community, Greg and Bill and George, working with um, the young people who are interested in this kind of science and technology. So thank you very much. Yes. Uh, that's a great question. They're uh, they're quite ubiquitous. Uh, so we'll see them. Um, you will see them primarily in the fall and the winter. You see less of them in the summer times. And you can, as it was, well, I showed you here today it was pretty typical where it could last like all afternoon. You know, and if you're operating, I mean, the variations for this particular kind of disturbance, the variation is two and a half hours. So you may, may not notice it too much unless you look at everything in aggregate. But if you're, if you're operating a contest and you're one of those, if you're a Tim Duffy or a W3 LPL, you know, and you're really trying to, you know, look at your scores and look at behavior of the bands over the long term, this may be something to consider. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, that is another good question. It's also something we're working on. So we're doing a statistical study right now. Um, uh, we're, we're doing, we, Bill Engelke and uh, Diego, uh, Die, you saw Diego in here. Diego's been working on a project where he's looked at a year's worth of these TID disturbances, and he's uh, created histograms to say, we see more of them on this time, and this time, and this time, uh, as a function of uh, season and year, and he's starting to work on correlating that with the rural activity and with other geophysical indices. And uh, Bill Engelke, he's using a machine learning approach to again, automatically detect these TIDs in our system and relate it back to these geophysical indices. So the goal by the time we're done with this project is to be able to say, if you have an auroral activity level of this much, if like the auroral electrojet index reaches this or if these conditions are met, you are more likely to have these TIDs. You're welcome. Yes. Um, so there's a number of things. Um, one of the things that, one of the other big projects that we have right now is, uh, of course, the Personal Space Weather Station, which you heard about with um, the Tangerine. Uh, a sister project to the Tangerine falling under the Personal Space Weather Station umbrella is something called the Grape uh, Receiver. And this is a receiver that's just looking at Doppler shifts of the received WWV signal. 
And we can see these same sorts of traveling atmospheric disturbances in those measurements as well. So we actually have, a, a, we've already been running grapes now for about two years. So we have some good measurements of that. Uh, Veronica, who's in the picture here, she is working at figuring out how you can take those measurements and uh, figure out which way the TIDs are going and what the wavelength is. And she'll be giving a talk in tomorrow afternoon's HamSci forum. Um, Diego will be as well. Uh, and they, so those grapes, those HF Doppler shifts are something that's going to help a lot as well. And when we get the Tangerine SDR up and running, there's going to be another set of measurements we can make with that that will help as well. Yes? Yes. Um, let's see, probably about 10, I'm guessing. <laughs> so um, we just got this one um, this year. Uh, we have Christina Collins. Uh, she is a PhD student uh, working on the Personal Space Weather Station, the Great Project um, at Case Western. Uh, she just submitted a paper to Atmospheric Measurement Techniques um, last week. Um, she also published um, a peer-reviewed article in IEEE uh, GRSL. Uh, John Gibbons, he published the Grape 1 um, Schematics and Plans in Hardware X. Uh, I've published um, another um, one about, I've published in Space Weather uh, about solar flares and geomagnetic storms during 2017. And I should also say we have a really excellent funding record. Um, I've been able to get between these projects over uh, two and a half million dollars in federal grants to support this research. And that's getting um, shared between multiple institutions, including the University of Scranton, Case Western Reserve University, um, the New Jersey Institute of Technology, uh, uh, Tapper is uh, and Zephyr Engineering, they're part of that effort. And then it also helps when we do have people who are working on these projects, um, if they are, you know, really committed to the project, sometimes if we need them to make measurements, we're actually able to provide the equipment for them rather than having people pay out of their own pocket and are able to fund people to travel to the HamSci workshop and to other conferences. What's that? Oh, so um, I guess a couple other things. Uh, this weekend we have booth talks. So if you go to hamsci.org, you can uh, read about uh, hamsci activities. Uh, over uh, the hamsci booth is at 5008, but if you go to building four, volt, building four where uh, Youth on the Air is, there's a, a TV set up in the back. And HamSci will be giving booth talks throughout the weekend about our activities. We have our forum tomorrow in forum room four at 2.50 p.m., I believe. Uh, just go to HamSci.org and you can get all of that information. And I think that's it. I am, I personally am giving essentially this exact same talk in the booth at 11 a.m. So you've pretty much heard it. I might go into a little more detail in that talk. Uh, and uh, if you go to hamsite.org, we just had our hamsite workshop in Huntsville, Alabama this past March. There are video recordings of the whole workshop there. Uh, they're not edited yet. We're working on getting them edited, but you can still watch the raw recordings there. And we're hoping to have the hamsite workshop next March at the University of Scranton. And uh, we're hoping ARDC has just uh, agreed to fund a new ham radio at, station at Scranton. And so thank you, ARDC. We greatly appreciate it. We are hoping to get that built before the HamSci workshop in Scranton. Um, we'll, we'll do our best with supply chain shortages and everything else. You never know, but that's the goal. <laughs> well, I, I appreciate your patience as well. All right, thanks, Nathaniel. And I want to point out, too, uh, the, uh, as well as the HamSci Forum, tomorrow in Forum Room 4 at 2.50, today in Forum Room 
3, I believe it is, is the SDR forum at 355. And I'll, I will be talking a little bit more about uh, Tangerine SDR. And I will be talking in Nathaniel's forum about Tangerine SDR, two, two different approaches to different perspectives of the same hardware. So if you're interested in that. And people can come and actually put their hands in hardware. And you can come to our booth right next to Nathaniel's booth, 5009, 10, 11, in building five. And you can see boards and put your hands on them and make sure and burn parts out, you know, with static and things like that. So no static straps. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much. That uh, concludes the uh, Tapper Forum for Hamvention today. So thanks for coming by, and we'll look forward to seeing you all next weekend or, I mean, next year or at the booth this weekend.